know, the name of Jesus, if you never really just sat and thought about it, the name of Jesus is just so powerful, just saying that name. And I'm not talking about magic, mystical art, stuff like that. I mean just the name of Jesus is so powerful, it can get you through any situation you're in. He's not just some billboard or some poster or some uh, a movie you watch with Jesus in it. He's the Son of God. He's your Savior. He's my Savior. It's not just another thing to say. It's not just another thought, another uh, story or fable. Jesus is God. And He lives inside of you if you're justified tonight. If you're saved, He lives inside of you. Amen? We all here tonight? Are we awake? Praise the Lord. Thank you for having me once again, Pastor Matt uh, and his family. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be able to come and speak before you and to speak before anybody. Uh, as a minister of the gospel, I always have something to say, believe it or not. In Bible college, we like to talk a whole lot. Stay up till 3 or 4 in the morning if you're not careful, just talking. Uh, but there's a difference just between talking and preaching the gospel. And we're all called to preach the gospel as Christians. And I don't mean all behind a pulpit. I mean every single one of us in here might not be called to stand up on a stage and a platform and speak behind a pulpit. But we're all called to preach the gospel in our lives, expressing Christ, and with our mouths, telling others about the Lord Jesus. We're not living in another day than the book of Acts. We're still in the same time period as they are. We still have everything that they had. We, the, the new covenant is being revealed more and more to us every single day. If you're walking in the grace of God and you're growing in His knowledge and His grace, that means you're learning more of His new covenant, of what Jesus did at Calvary, because that's the only way this bread of life right here can restore your soul, can renew your mind and your spirit. Amen? Amen? Well, praise the Lord. If you could turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6 is where we'll begin, verse 8. Before I begin, you know, I just, I'm, I'm still feeling that, you know, the name of Jesus, Jesus at the center of it all. That's been on my heart for a, a couple weeks now, just the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what you're going through. I like that old song I've been listening to, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The sweetest name I know, Master, Master, Savior, like the fragrance after the rain. That's not what it says. I got a little mixed up, but you get the just of it. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Is Jesus the sweetest name you know? Or is something else in your life taking reign over Him? Because when you get down in the valley, when you get down in the hard place between the rock and the valley, what are you going to do then? Just reading a couple chapters in your Bible ain't going to save you from what's out there awaiting you, from your trials. What are you going to do when you're on that interstate and you get in a wreck and, and it's your fault and you ain't got enough money to cover it? What about when you lose that job that is just you thought was the best thing in the world? That's when you say Jesus. Amen. What happens when the bills are due and you don't have enough money? Jesus. Amen. All that kind of stuff didn't just happen in the Bible days or 20 or 30 years ago. It can happen right now. If you've got bills that you can't pay, Jesus can pay them. Amen. What happens when that family member that you've been praying for for years still won't accept Jesus? You've still got to trust in Him. You've still got to. Not because we have to, because we should want to, because of everything He's done for us. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a little quiet in here tonight. <laughs> we'll fix that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 8. I'm going to read a, uh, about 9, 10 verses right here, and then we're going to pray. We'll be jumping around in some scripture tonight. I hope you brought your Bibles to church. I'll try not to keep you for too long on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week. I know how it is. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 8. 
Verse 8 says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Verse 9 says, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you pass not such a place, for thither the, the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which is of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and spy where he is, and I may send you and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he them the horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host surrounded the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered and said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you tonight, and I thank you for being here with us. Let us experience your presence on a day-to-day -day basis and giving us access to come into your throne room boldly, Lord. Lord, and I thank you for that opportunity to minister tonight, to be here, another chance to worship you, another chance to another opportunity, Lord, to, to wake up and worship you in spirit and in truth and, and to proclaim your gospel, Lord. I ask that you be with us tonight for the remainder of the service, Lord. Anoint my lips, Lord, to speak your word and right from my heart, Lord, that the true teacher, the Holy Spirit, would come and, and not me, but Lord, but you would speak through me, Lord. And I ask you to open up the, the hearts and the eyes of the understanding of all of us here that we might learn and be edified and encouraged tonight, Lord. I ask you to do this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I don't normally tell stories, but I just felt feel led tonight to tell a story. <clears throat> What I want to talk to tonight about is really uh, um, looking to the things that are eternal and not temporary. And if sometimes we find ourselves in certain circumstances where that's really all we can think about is what's going on right then. What they did, what I did, oh I messed up, or oh, this isn't going how I wanted it to. So I'm going to tell a story tonight that he's told several times uh, and I've heard probably uh, millions of times throughout my life. But my dad, if you don't know him, uh, Curtis Hutchinson, pastors in Queen City, Texas, Crossway Church. I have this sticker on here. Um, when I was two, uh, we were in a charismatics church, charismaniacs, what we like to call it, because it was a bunch of crazy stuff. Everything, every wind of doctrine that came through town got blew into the doorsteps and we grabbed a hold of it and preached it and did it. And I mean anything you can think of. People making fire truck noises, barking like dogs, clucking like chickens. You name it, we did it. I don't remember it, but I've been told several times by several people that were there. And uh, my dad, was, has a, he was an associate pastor and my mom, he was a, a gym teacher my mom was at work there and uh, that was what that was their jobs it, they were all about ministry had something going every single night and I was two my brother was six five or six my older sister lived with us and uh, <clears throat> it got to a, a place where and it always happens if you don't know the truth of the gospel uh, burnout a, a church split and uh we left the church, lost everything, the land we lived on, the house that was on the land, all the vehicles, everything we had, we lost. Um, and if you continue in a place of not preaching the gospel, even if you're ignorant of it like we were, you'll lose everything. 
And in that place, in that valley, uh, we began to hear, my dad began to listen to SBN over the radio. 100.1 Atlanta, Texas was one of the first stations that uh, Brother Swaggart put out there. And he began to listen to Francis and Friends and uh, began to hear about the message of the cross. Uh, and he began to hear all the scripture that backed it up. And at first he turned it off, of course, and said, I'm beyond the cross that was where I got saved. Why do I have to stay there? What's it going to do for me now? Um, but it, as he began to be, be broken and, and had nowhere to turn to, these circumstances, uh, they looked un, unbearable. We moved in with my grandma, a hundred-year-old house, one bathroom, three kids, a husband and a wife living with a grandma, my mom's mom, about 20 or 30 cats outside running around. Now, that's not the place... Uh, 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 a man wants to be in life with a family, right? If you're a man, you don't want to live with your mother-in-law with 30 cats. <laughs> I love my granny and I love my family, but you shouldn't want to live there. If you're a man, you should want to have your own house for your family, right? So you can see these circumstances that my dad was going through. He probably thought it can't get any worse than this. So he, the Lord brought him to a place of brokenness. And uh, I don't want to take too long telling a story, but pretty much what I want to say, um, with all humility, no arrogance, but my dad, instead of looking at the circumstances, began to see how broken he was. And he, and he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, all I know is that you love me and I love you. That's all I know. He had to come to a place of realization and realize all that back there was messed up because it wasn't in the Word of God. And he began to hear more about the cross and about how as you have received the Lord Jesus, so walk you in Him. If you received Him at Calvary, you walk by, with Him daily by faith. That's how you're conformed into the image of Christ. And he began to learn more and more about that. And the Lord called him to pastor a church, to start a church, to build a church from nothing. And he, and he said, Lord, there's a hundred churches around here, literally, where I live, in a small town. There's a hundred churches around here. Why, why? And the Lord finally answered him and said, nobody's preaching my truth. The message of the cross, the gospel of Jesus, the power of God. Nobody's preaching my truth. And my dad said, how am I going to preach the cross for the rest of my life? And ever since then, every time he opened up the Word of God, he sees Jesus, not because of Him, who He is, but because He asked the Lord with a broken and contrite spirit, like David said in the Psalms. He asked the Lord to reveal this to Him so that we could live for God. And every page of every book, on every book with every page in it is about Jesus and what He did for us at Calvary. Amen. And when you understand that, you can truly live for the Lord. And with no pride or arrogance, just to show you what will happen if you look beyond your circumstances and look to Jesus, the one that you're placed in in salvation. The Lord restored our land, our vehicles. A house was built on it instead of a double wide on it. The church has grown. People have been saved. Lives have been changed. And it's all because somebody looked beyond their circumstances and look to the eternal things and not the temporary things. Amen? Amen. That's all because that's, that's what will happen. The Lord will prosper you financially, physically, but most importantly, spiritually. The Lord will prosper you no matter what you're going through if you look to Him and not what's around you. Amen? Amen. Just like we see in this story tonight. The servant of Elisha, he was looking at everything around like we like to do. When we're going through something, he was looking at everything around him and began to doubt and he began to fear what was going on. The Lord opened up his eyes and let him see. Just picture that on a mountain surrounded by the king of Syria's army. Probably so many soldiers. I'm sure he was shaking in his boots. You know, I'm sure he was terrified, but the Lord opened up his eyes. Elisha prayed that he would open up his eyes and he saw all the, the angels and chariots of fire. How many of you know we live in a better covenant now? We live in a new covenant. 
we don't see a bunch of angels and chariots of fire, but that the very God that sent those is, is fought on our behalf at Calvary. He's already won. He's in us. We're not fighting against the devil. I hope everybody knows that. We're not out of, at, in a war and, and I... I hear people say all the time, all the time, we're going to declare war against the devil. We're not declaring war against the devil. He was already beat. His head was already crushed. Amen. 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 So we're not declaring war against the devil because if we did it by ourselves, guess what? We'd lose. But Jesus has already won. He's already conquered death, hell, and the grave. Amen. Uh, you know, as Christians going through things at times, we tend to uh, focus on what's bothering us in our circumstances. I like to read a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Very common scripture we've all heard, amen? If we're focusing on our situation instead of God, there's an issue of pride there because we're worried about what's going to happen to us instead of we, instead of realizing that every situation that God puts you in, that's testing and pressing you, it's for His glory. It's for us to have a closer relationship with Him in the end result and during the trial. Have you ever found yourself in a trial, uh, and if you haven't, stay in the faith a little longer and you will. If you've ever found yourself in a trial or you're in one right now, sometimes it's easy to just... Start trying to fix it yourself or, or start trying to rely on things that take your mind off of it for a, a split second, maybe even good things. But when God puts us through things, He doesn't want us to use other ways. He don't want us just to get through it, just to get by. He don't want us to look up a year later and we forgot about it. He wants us to draw closer to Him. The reason that God puts us through things is to get us closer to Him. Who wouldn't want to get closer to Him? Man, it's quiet in here. Has He saved you tonight? Has He filled you tonight? Amen. Has He filled you tonight? Has He saved you? Do you know the truth of the gospel? Are you walking in His light? Yes. Maybe we're all in storms tonight. Maybe that's why it's so quiet. Well, maybe this is an on-time word. It can be quiet. I know what that means when it's quiet. My mom used to tell me and my dad all the time we'd be preaching after we'd say, man, it was just so quiet. I wonder if anybody was listening. And she'd say, we were just, we were just taking it in. Just maybe, and that's what we're doing tonight. Amen. Hopefully. Praise the Lord. But when God puts us in something, it's not just to, just to uh, learn more about ourselves. It's definitely not to learn self-worth and self-love and all that. That's a bunch of stuff that uh, it sounds good, but it's not right. I'm just going ahead and burst your bubble. You're nothing in your in and of yourselves. I'm nothing in and of. I'll say that firstly. Before you, I'm nothing in myself. Uh, God doesn't want to show us how uh, worthy we are. He wants to show us how worthy He is and how 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 unworthy we are. And if you look at Christ and Him up on that cross, and if you're looking at Him as the author and finisher of your faith, you're going to see how unworthy you are. That's right. How unworthy I am. And if you're not in a place like that and you think anybody could have just died on that cross, then you know, you're in a pretty dangerous place. <laughs> Nobody but Jesus could have done what Jesus did. Right. Jesus, Philippians 2.8, was obedient unto death. Jesus kept the faith so that now we could keep that same faith. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. Andrew didn't. Mm -hmm. Try. Brother Swagger didn't. Pastor Matt didn't. Jesus died for you. That way when you get in a tough situation, you don't have to rely on yourself just to be strong and I can get through this. I don't know about you, but when I'm in a tough situation, I'm a little crybaby about it. I want to reach up to heaven and hold my Savior in my arms. And I know that the Lord wraps His loving arms around us when we're in t situations like that. Amen? Amen. That's what we, we've, we've got to be more dependent on Him. Everybody, you know, it's, it's opposite of the way that the world works. When you grow up away from your father and your mother, you, you become more independent on yourself than you should be. But when you grow in the faith of Christ, 
and the grace and knowledge of this Word, you become more dependent on God. He doesn't want you to just get a little bit of truth so you can go live independently from Him. The more you learn about Him, the more dependent you are on Him. Right. Okay. If we're focused on any everything we're going through, uh, the trial that God put us in is going to be pointless. The things, and, and, and think about this. If God has put you through something, because He loves you, obviously. If, if He's put you through something you think is just so hard, it's so much harder than the last trial, why do I have to go through this? Why, think about this for a second. Why would you waste any time in that trial? Not clinging to God, not holding fast to His nail-scarred hand and what He's done for you. If it's the hardest thing you've ever gone through, why are we wasting time in the midst of it? Why aren't we doing what God put us there to do? A lot of people think that uh, they, they, they leave Christianity because when the going gets tough and they really start digging in and God tests their faith with fire, they say, I don't deserve this. I cleaned up my life. Why is God doing this to me? I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. I stopped partying. Why is this happening to me? I thought it was all uh, roses from now on. No, what we don't understand most of the time is that Christianity is not all just roses and, and, and doves 24-7. We're not always on the mountaintop. Most of the time we're in the valley. I'm more of a valley person because when I get on the mountaintop, I like to push people off, <laughs> including the one who put me up there. We're just being real tonight. I'm more of a valley person. I believe we're all called to be in the valley at some point in time, and sometimes we're called to be on the mountaintop, even if it lasts for half a day. Right? Just being real. But when we're in that valley... He doesn't want us just to barely get through every single day. I found myself in situations that I knew God put me in. I knew without a shadow of a doubt. And everybody around me knew God put me in that situation. And you know how easy it is to start relying on other things? It makes it so much worse. If we would just rely on Jesus and what He did for us at Calvary, we'll not only come out of that thing quicker... But we'll come out of that thing closer to Him mm -hmm. with the prayers being met. If you want to grow in Christ, just ask Him to break you. If you want to grow. If you don't, be careful what you ask for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Know what you're asking for. Know who you're asking. The things that you're asking for. The Lord desires that we're all drawn closer to Him. And He'll use anything, everything it takes, anything it takes to... To get you closer to Him. If you're running from God, He's going to do anything it takes to get you closer to Him. Amen. A lot of people think He'll just let you run wild and free. Well, He will. He doesn't oppose your free will. He doesn't uh, uh, take away your free will. But He's going to do things to get you closer to Him that might hurt. A lot of times we put ourselves in, in situations and we call it God putting us through trials. But really, it's just us and our rebellious ways. If we would just know the will of God for our lives, and the only way we can do that is being in tune with Him, being in covenant with Him by His blood, if we would just know the will of God for our lives, we wouldn't put ourselves in situations that would hurt us so bad. God, There's a lot of things that we've been through, me, and, me included in my life, that God didn't intend for us to go through. But He can use that situation for the good. He can turn around that situation for the good. So don't sit there and condemn yourself over it because God wants to move in every situation. God wants to move here tonight. God wants to move two weeks from now when you mess up and you feel like, oh, how did I do this again? How did I end up here again? I can't believe I, I, I did this to them again. I said I'd never do it again. God doesn't write you off. And it's not blasphemy to, to think and to say this, that as soon as you mess up, you can turn around and enter the throne room right there and receive forgiveness from God. 
and be washed by His blood. Yes. How many of you know we're not living under the Old Testament anymore? Paul, or whoever the writer of Hebrews is, writes and says that sins were remembered every year again because they had to, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't wash away sins. But the blood of Jesus has washed away every single one of my sins. Every single one of your sins has been washed away. Do you believe Jesus did that for you? Do you believe that in the midst of your trial, it doesn't matter what's going on, you can go forward. Even when it feels like you're going backwards, you can go forward. Even when it doesn't feel like it, God can still be working in you. Even when you think His presence isn't there, it's there working in your heart. If your faith is in what only the Holy Spirit can operate in, the cross of Christ. That is what He moves in. That's what He works in. If your faith is in there, it's not a question of maybe or might, He might be working. Just because you don't feel it, God is still working in you if your faith is right. Amen. Isn't that awesome? We can wake up and know that we're right with God. Now, I heard somebody say this yesterday. I don't remember who it was. But they said, even when I mess up and get in the flesh... I can repent and ask for forgiveness and know right there in the midst of that, of feeling like a failure, I'm still right with God. He still looks down at me and sees me as righteous. The God that created the earth. Think about all the people that's ever been on the earth, that's ever walked the earth, and you were on His mind at Calvary. You. He knew everything you would ever do that would displease Him. And He still gave His life for you. Yeah. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And He knew everything. You know, God's never had a new thought. And the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that we're always on His mind. I believe that's in Psalms 92. But if it's not, I'm sorry. But if God has never had a new thought, and we've, and we've always been on His mind... We're always, his, thought, his thoughts are ever on us, is what it says. That means that God's been thinking of us from eternity's past. And there's no beginning to God, and there's definitely no end to God. So He'll be thinking about us for all eternity. And if that doesn't get you excited in the midst of your trial, it, isn't it funny sometimes how... We just look around and just get so upset at the silliest things. One day when we're in heaven, we won't be thinking about it, but if we could, we'd be looking back and saying, why was I even worried about that? <laughs> Come on. If we really got a hold of how good God was, who He is, and what He did for us, and including myself, then in the midst of the storm and in the midst of the trial, we wouldn't be affected as bad as we are. We can look up and say, what? oh my, God that created the heavens of the earth sees me as righteous. Yes. Yes. No matter what I did two hours ago, God looks down and sees me as righteous, placed in His Son Jesus, seated at the right hand of Him. All the benefits are mine. All the benefits are yours. Did you, I, did you hear me? All the benefits are yours. Every single thing that Christ has is yours. You're joint heirs with Christ. You're not some cousin. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're not a stepson. You're not a stepdaughter. You're not a, a half brother or sister of Christ. You're in the bloodline of God. And when we go through things, if we would just think about that. When we wake up in the morning and our trial is the first thing we think about. If we would just, Jesus. If we would just say, Jesus. I'm justified by your blood. God, you called those things that aren't as though as which they were, and you justified me. Man, my Lord, I'm about ready to shout up in here tonight. I'll just preach to myself tonight. Hallelujah. I'm glad y'all are here tonight, and I'm so glad to be here. Every, every chance I get to preach is just... Uh, uh, 
really humbling to me get to speak the the, the, the word of God. And I, and I appreciate you for having me. Like, you're so receptive. You remind me a lot of my home church back in Queen City. Just love the word of God, love the gospel. And I see the faces that you make too when I say th when I m maybe say something that ain't all the way right, but I correct it. I, I'm glad you're being attentive. I'm glad that Pastor Matt's teaching you the word. And I'm not saying I'm getting up here and spilling out false doctrine. And you know what I mean when I say something like, uh, Moses built the ark or Noah let out the children of Israel. You know what I mean. <laughs> but this is a place that preaches the Word of God, how it should be. You, you know everything that's being said tonight. I'm here to encourage you again and hopefully teach you a little bit uh, uh, about certain things. God has, in the midst of our trial, if we're being dominated by fear, that's a place that God never intended us to be. God has not called His children to be a, a people of fear. Um, and, and we're all guilty of that at times. Being Any worry, any stress, any doubt is not of God. That's not who He is. Uh, what He's done for you eliminates all that. And you might say, well, why do I keep finding myself in this place? Why do I keep... Uh, why am I fearful 24-7? Well, let's talk about it tonight a little bit. Faith is the opposite of fear. Vice versa. Fear is the opposite of faith. Where there is no faith or there is faith in the wrong object, fear is controlling that person. Been there. I can testify to that. If your faith is not in Christ and what He did at Calvary... That perfect love that was displayed at Calvary that casts out all fear, it's not working in your heart. And if that love is not there, guess what's there? That fear. Yeah. Fear isn't just a... Uh, it's not talked about enough, I don't think. Um, when a person operates by faith, the enemy, the devil, cannot control us by fear. And I don't talk too much about the devil because he's not really much worth talking about. Uh, he was defeated, and I don't have to deal with him if my faith is in Christ and what right. he did. But tonight I want to talk a little bit about uh, fear. And uh, whenever we trust in anything other than Christ and his cross, we revive the sin nature. That's in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to talk about that just for a little bit. And when we re revive uh, the sin nature, the devil can use fear as a force of destruction of our faith in our lives. I'm going to repeat that. Whenever we trust in anything else other than Calvary, the devil can now, we've now opened the door for him to use fear to influence us, our decisions, to use the sin nature to control us by fear. We open the door to a whole new ball game that God is really forbidding, the Bible says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Let it not be so, is what that means translated in the Greek. God doesn't want us to be dominated by the sin nature. It's not normal for a Christian to be operating in fear and not in faith. Could you turn with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 14 tonight? This is a chapter uh, that we've been we went through on, uh, when we got back from Christmas break in our Romans class. It's a very hard chapter to understand. Uh, you can't understand it unless you're looking at it in the light of, of Calvary, of the cross. Just like the entire rest of the Bible, you can't understand it. And what we what I preached last time I was here, all God's words are in righteousness. The, God, the righteousness of God's revealed in the gospel. So the Bible has to be preached in the context of the gospel. Jesus and what he did at Calvary for the word to be understood. So we're going to talk about Romans 7 tonight, verse 14, and how if we place our faith in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of our trial, if we're looking at our circumstances and what we can do instead of what God has already done 2,000 years ago at Calvary, we're going to see how the sin nature can be revived just for a quick minute and how the devil can use fear to, to influence us. Verse 14, Paul tells us that we're, we're sold under sin. 
were all sold under sin back in the garden. We all know what happened. Adam and Eve fell and the sin nature was implanted in every human being born after that. Besides Jesus being 100% God, 100% man, He didn't have a sin nature, but everybody else did. Me and you have a sin nature. Even if you're saved, we have a sin nature. It's not active unless we place our faith in what we can do, anything other than Christ, but we do have a sin nature, but it's not active. Think about it as being unplugged from a wall. Let's read verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. And I'm going to slow down because I know that's a bunch of I would, I did that, and I didn't do that, and I would want to do that. And I, it's hard to understand. But uh, verse 16 Paul's really saying, and I just want to read to you what the, the, pretty much translated in good old Northeast, Northeast Texan. I'm going to read it to y'all. If I'm doing the things that I, I, I do not want to do because I love God, I look to the law as a way to fix it because the law is of God. That's what Paul's pretty much saying. If I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, and Paul wrote this before, he, while he was saved, but before he knew the message of the cross, the revelation of the cross, the power of God that enables us to live for him. He, he, wrote, he wrote this when he knew it, but he was referring to a time in his life when he didn't know it. Um, and Paul's pretty much saying, uh, if I'm doing the things I don't want to do because I love God, if I, because I didn't know the truth, I was looking to the law because it's of God. It's in the Bible. Just like us. When we're doing the things we don't want to do and we're failing God, oftentimes, even after knowing the truth, the sanctifying truth, how to grow in Christ, even after knowing that, sometimes we, when we mess up, we, we still like to go grab our Bibles and read ten chapters. and We might never say that with our lips, but we think that just was okay. It made up for what we did on Tuesday when we did that big old piece of stupid. When you, when you cut somebody off and then they flipped you off and you pulled in and followed them and gave them a piece of your mind. Now, I've never done nothing like that, but uh, maybe you have. Uh, that's a joke. But uh, I, don't, I really can't remember a time that I've done that, but I've done things that I shouldn't have on the road. Amen? We'll leave that at that. That's my life. You know, we all have... Whatever. Let's continue. Uh, Paul's pretty much... And when we, when we do those things, Paul is making it so simple for us to relate to, to the things he went through. And it's not just Paul. It's not just me. It's something that we've all done. Sometimes when we mess up, we try to fix it in and of ourselves. We try to give 20 more dollars in the offering plate this week. We, uh, we go give a little... A few dollars to the to the bell ringers at Walmart, you know. Uh, we do a, a good deed, something like that. We pray. This is just examples. But Paul, what Paul is saying, let's keep reading verse 17 to 20. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. He's saying that when he does the things he doesn't want to do. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. That if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. Paul's pretty much saying here, <clears throat> and he's writing it in a, in a way that... Uh, I guess it's hard for a lot of people to understand, and it really is. If you just picked up your Bible and read this without the first thing you turn to, you'd probably close it and say, I'm never reading that again, if you didn't understand anything. Uh, but Paul, Paul's saying here what I've been saying. If we consent to the law or anything, if we look to the law or anything other than Christ for, for our, not just for salvation, 
but after salvation, once we're already saved, if we look to that as a way to overcome fear, as a way to overcome this thing in my life, this thing, my attitude, my cussing problem, uh, or if you just mess up, if you look to law, the sin nature can be revived and fear comes back up in your life and the enemy, Satan, now can you've now opened the door to him to influence you by fear. But like I said before, I don't like to talk too much about the devil because he's, after Calvary, if your faith is in what crushed his head, because Genesis 3.15 said, the seed of the woman will crush your head, devil. God spoke that directly to him. It was a promise and it happened. That lets me know that now my, that my faith is in Christ, the devil can't, he can't do me no harm unless I turn and look to him, unless I open myself up for harm. You know, how many, how many of you know that the, the devil can't be everywhere at one time. He's not omnipresent. That's God. The devil can't read your thoughts. First time I heard that, I was like, well, how is that possible? The devil can't read your thoughts. You're a child of God. You're a saint of God. Do you really think that somebody like that can read your thoughts when Christ is dwelling in you? No. No. He can speak lies to you. And as you begin to talk and, and say these things, if you believe those lies, fear will grip you and control you if you turn to anything other than Christ and what He did for you. But the good news is, the bad news is, that the, the law of the mind, the law of our willpower, us saying we're going to do something and, 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 and doing this to overcome that, the law of the mind is not as powerful as the law of sin and death. And the devil operates according to the law of sin and death. That is how he is able to do what he does. If the sin nature is revived, the law of sin and death is the law that we're serving. That we think that we've placed ourselves back under. But the good news is, Romans chapter 8, verse 2, right here on the next page, the answer for a victorious and fearless life. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, that tells me right there that because of what Jesus did at Calvary, there's a new law written in my heart, and it's the most powerful law. It overrides the work of the enemy, the works of my flesh, the pull of the world, the pull of Satan and the lust of my mind and eyes. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That tells me that every single thing I'm struggling with, anything I'm going through that's not of God, has already been condemned at Calvary in the flesh. So when we put our faith in what Jesus did at Calvary, those things begin to fall off. Now, I'm going to say something with you, and I want you to bear with me, because a lot of people have said this in times past, but it's just not biblical. God puts us through trials, yes. He leaves certain things in our lives, like we see Paul talk about the thorn in his flesh. He leaves certain things in our lives to help us to rely on Him and to grow. But God isn't leaving a sin bondage in your life to help you to grow. That's right. If you have an attitude problem, God hasn't left that in, in your body, in your soul and spirit for you to struggle and for you to suffer with. God isn't leaving that in you for you to trust in Him. He wants you to trust in Him so that can be taken out of you. Because if that were true, if God did leave certain things in our lives like sin, bondages, things like that, that would mean that He condones sin. And God does not condone sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. But He puts us through certain trials to grow closer to Him, but He doesn't condone sin. If you will put your faith in Calvary tonight, that will fall off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. God's not going to make you wait two weeks after, while your faith's been in the cross for three months for that thing to fall off. It'll happen instantly. And the way that you'll know is the desire will be gone. You won't have to just force yourself not to even think about it. You won't want to do it. And if you have some bondages in your life tonight, God's called you to walk in a place free of bondages. 
As I found myself in bondages in years past, being dominated by sin, I realized that's not a place that God wants a Christian to be in. You're frustrating the grace of God. We've, we've frustrated the grace of God when we're being dominated by darkness and, and evil powers and influenced by the lies of the enemy. If we would serve God by faith in His Word, what He did at Calvary, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, if we would serve God, then that perfect love that works by faith could move in us and we could live a victorious life for Him. God's called His children, me and you, to walk in a place where our minds are set on things above and not things around us. The whole thing I want to... The whole point I want to get out, and we're going to read uh, just a, a few more, a couple more places tonight. I'm not going to keep you too much longer. But the whole point I'm trying to make is that even though I know there's people in this room going through things right now, because that's how Christianity works. We're not always going to be on the mountaintop all the time, like I said earlier. So if you're going through something tonight, or if you've previously went through something, and if you're not, then you're going to sometime in the near future. Amen. I'm not speaking negativity in your life. I'm just telling you the truth. Um, if you're going to, God wants to remind you tonight that we're to have our affections set on things above. In the midst of your circumstances, you're not to look to your circumstances. And I'm not talking about saying that that's really not happening. I'm, I'm in heaven and and with Jesus, and that's not even happening to me. I'm, it's not ha I'm, I'm too good for all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the midst of a fiery trial, whether it be good or bad, and the truth of, of the matter is every single thing we go through to us is bad. We can think that it's, it's, e it's, it's a little bit easier than last time, but it's still hard. God doesn't put us through things that are just easy where we can get through it just by taking a nap on it or something. <laughs> If you can do that, then it's not a trial. That's just something that you need to man up and get through. Yeah. Right? But God, you'll know the difference. God, God puts us through things that forces us to rely on Him. And if we don't, we will be miserable. Yeah. But God doesn't give us any trial that's beyond of what we're capable of getting through. That's what the Word says. That's what the Bible says. What your Bible says. God puts us through things so that we can rely on Him. But God has called us as His children during those things to set our affections on things above. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, If you then, being risen with Christ... How many in here is being risen with Christ? Just three of you, alright. Well, to you three... Nah, to you three, to the whole house, we're all saved. Amen? Amen. 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 If you then, being risen in Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And let me just add this. You're seated with Him. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2. You're seated with Christ. Verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We can be hidden in Christ, protected from the attack of the enemy, the pull of the world, and the lust of our flesh. Are those things going to still come knocking? Yes, they are. But guess where you are? Seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's why when people say, oh, they're too, they're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That's a testimony. When people want to come up and start talking about that and uh, all that right there and all this false doctrine and stuff and you're, you're, they call you too narrow-minded, well, get off this cross stuff and just be a little bit open to this. Look what it's doing over here. Look what all this uh, is doing for the young generation or for the older generation. Well, my Bible says that God, He never changes. Amen. And He's been working the same way from the foundation of the world. The Lamb was slain, I've already quoted it, 1 Peter 1.20, from the foundation of the world. God has been working through that, Psalms 33.4, all God's works are done in truth. He's been working through that since the beginning of the world. Before it was even done, God was mandating and orchestrating everything that He did through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. So when people come up and, and say that you're... You're too narrow-minded. And just tell them your affections, your, 
is set on things above. It's set on Christ and what He did at Calvary. That's where our mind should be. That's where we should be focused. You know how many times I've heard that in my life? You think about the cross too much. Oh, He's preaching again. Oh, what's He going to talk about? The cross. We know He is. We're not going to learn anything. We might as well just go read a book about the message of the cross or something. You know, that mindset is not a mindset of people setting their affections on things above. That's a mindset of pride. And it's not just me they say it to. It's anybody that preaches the Word of God in the context of its righteous righteousness, its righteous context in, in the context of Jesus Christ. You'll get made fun of. You'll get blasted all over social media if you have a Facebook or two Facebook like I like to say. You'll get made fun of. But guess what? It don't matter. Because what we go through in this life can can't even be counted as worthy as what we're going to go, what we're going to gain in Christ in heaven, and what we've already gained. The things that we go go through right now, they're not worthy to be compared to our salvation or our growth in Christ. He's called us to walk in a place where all we think about is Him. What I said when I first got up here: there's no harm to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. That's a song that I used to just sing, but, but I really started to think about it. There's no harm in that. People can call you all kind of stuff. They can say you're, uh, you talk about Jesus too much, all that stuff. It, actually, you're a little bit too serious with I love the Lord and I'll go to church on Easter, but I want to do what I want to do during the week. I don't want to have to read my Bible and pray and, and not be able to do these things and you know, well, everybody says they're desperate for the Lord and unless they're doing something that's pleasing their flesh. Then they're saying, God, I'll be desperate for you on Sunday. And I'll lift my hands and get on my knees on Wednesday night. Or when I need you. Or when all is going wrong in my life and everything's in shackles, then I'll cry out to you, God. When many don't realize that if we were crying out to God, my people perish for lack of knowledge and if my people would humble themselves and pray. We don't realize that if we would cry out to God on a regular basis and keep our faith where it's supposed to be, those things wouldn't have to happen. Not that you're never going to go through anything because like I've said tonight, God uses things like that for a good purpose. But, but some of the things that we go through, God didn't intend for us to go through. And we can save ourselves a lot of harm, a lot of time, a lot of pain. Amen? Our things, our minds should be on things above and that which is eternal. Could you turn with me to one more place tonight? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. This is a well-known passage of Scripture. Paul is uh, he's really talking about ministry, suffering for, for preaching the gospel for Christ's sake. But he's also talking about just living this Christian life. If you're a minister, and we all are ministers of Christ, and when I say minister right now, I'm talking about every single Christian, not a a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, an apostle, a teacher, not the fivefold everybody. We're all branches abiding in Christ. We're all one body that has different functions. Every one is just as important as the other. But uh, it, Paul's talking about suffering for the sake of Christ, something that we'll all have to do if we get serious about our relationship with Jesus. Let's read in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe you, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, 
knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Thank you, Jesus. The light affliction that we think is so bad right now works in us a far more exceedingly Great weight of glory. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Our affliction is nothing to be compared to what we're going to receive. Yeah. If you can't get your mind off of your affliction and your circumstance and look up and set your affections on things above and see all that Jesus has not only already given you, but is going to give you when you see Him. My Lord, He's given you everything. He's already given you everything. Picture how good it's going to be when we get to heaven. A far more exceedingly weight of glory. Praise the Lord. Eternal weight of glory. Somebody's going to get it here tonight. A far more exceeding great weight of glory. God is going to put a weight of glory on you in this lifetime if you let him. He's already given us the Holy Spirit. What a down payment to working in us, quickening our mortal bodies. If I, my goodness, yeah. praise the Lord. Sometimes we just mope around when we're going through things, but we, if, if we saw not the natural things, but the supernatural things, if we look to Jesus as the author and the finisher, yeah. we would see that the Holy Spirit is working in us, quickening us, our mortal bodies. He's changing you. He's conforming you to the image of the very one that died for you. He's saving you. He saved you, justified you, and He's continually saving yes. you and changing Hallelujah. you into His image. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Somebody's going to get it. Somebody's yes. going to praise the Lord Hallelujah. in this place tonight. Come on. A far more exceeding weight of glory is what's for you. If you keep the faith, if you finish the course, if you run the race, God's got a far more exceeding weight of glory yes. for you. Yes. Praise Him. Thank you, Lord, for what you've already done for me. Thank you for what you're going to do for me, Lord. We praise you in this place. A far more exceeding weight of glory is what he's got for his children. Not a spirit of fear, not a, a bondage, a, a spirit of laziness, of heaviness, but a far more exceeding weight of glory. He purchased you with his blood. And he purchased every single benefit. If we would grab a hold, if we would realize what He did for us at Calvary, we would have a far more exceeding weight of glory. Praise the Lord. He's good, isn't He? He's not called us to a spirit of fear, a spirit of lack. In Christ, there's no lack. He's my shepherd. I shall not lack. I shall not want. In Christ, there's everything. In Christ, there's peace. In Christ, there's happiness. There's joy. There's meekness. There's humility. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's a new car if yours breaks down. There's a new job. There's a wife. There's a husband. There's a house. Your relationship's fixed in the name of Jesus. Your body's healed in the name of Jesus. The far exceeding weight of glory is yours in the name of Jesus. The addiction is broken in the name of Jesus. Not in any other name, but in the name of Jesus. You can get out of your bed in the morning and quit feeling sorry for ourselves. And wake up and see that it don't matter what they did. It don't matter that I lost that, that I did that last week. Jesus redeemed me at Calvary and has given me a far more exceeding way to glory. A far more. Praise God. 
Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's, he saved you. He's baptized you with the Holy Spirit. He's given you the truth to be able to stay in communion with Him. Is that not enough to live for Him? Amen. He gave His yeah. whole life for you, so we should live our whole lives for Him. Yeah, amen. Amen. Through much tribulation will we inherit the kingdom and enter the kingdom of God, is what Barnabas said in Acts. Amen. If we can't withstand a little bit of tribulation, a, a little bit of persecution, and, and we've seen nothing yet. You know, in China, they can't even have church or a Bible. That's why there's such a move of God over there, such a hunger for God. Over here, I've got four Bibles in my dorm room right now. People can't even have Bibles. We've got Bibles collecting dust on the shelf that we hadn't opened in two years. All we know is John 3.16. That's the only relationship we have with God, a Wednesday and, 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 and Sunday. And I'm, not, I, I'm sure no one in here... I'm not talking about anybody in, in particular. If you're listening to me on Facebook or YouTube or however you hear this, maybe you have a, a relationship with God that's a, only a church service, is only a, through your grandma or through your parents, through their faith. There's coming a day where you can't rely on, on the faith of your parents to get you through life. Yeah. It's not going to save you. I can't, I can't understand that. Uh, I can't even fathom the, the things that I go through from time to time. How can anybody that's unsaved even bear that in their mind? Amen. Without Jesus, I would crumble. Oh, yeah. Without Jesus, I would give up. Yeah. Without Jesus, I'd throw my life away. But with Jesus, I have a far more exceeding weight of glory. Oh, yes. Not just when I get to heaven, but right now. Right. Not just ten years from now with whatever I'm doing. Not just if I was a, not a preacher, didn't have friends, didn't have a family. If God took away your local church, if He took away, if you weren't called to preach, if you had no singing ability, if you had no ability whatsoever and all you could do was believe in God, would you still do it? We need to think about that. Our calling does not save us. Jesus saves us. And though we might go through things we think impossible sometimes, that's what God specializes in. Amen. You got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains, any valleys you think you can't get through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He'll make a way for you. Amen. He'll make a way for you. Amen. Through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. If I didn't have any problems, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. Amen? Amen? That's one of my favorite songs. If I didn't have any problems, and I used to think as a Christian when it was only just up here and not working in here, I, I don't have any problems. I don't know what all the crazy preachers up there talking about. I'm not going through anything like that. But when I began to let the Lord become real to me in here, I started to realize... That I'll be going through things that are seem impossible to me. And though they might not be joyous times, we can still count it for joy. Knowing that in Amen. that trial, and on the other side, though I'm being burnt up and tried by fire, it's more precious than gold or silver. Come on. And that on the other side, I'll be closer to Jesus than I was before. Amen. And if that's what you want, God will give it to you. Amen. Amen. We've got to keep our faith in the right source. Christ and Him crucified, yeah, and we can get right. through anything. Hallelujah.